What is going on, everyone? James Hancock here. I'm back to review the season five finale of The Expanse, an episode appropriately titled Nemesis Games. I'm just going to come out right and say it. This was my favorite episode of all five seasons. This is almost embarrassing to admit, but I was so fired up and excited during certain scenes. Several times I had to pause the show and just walk around a bit and take a few notes before continuing. And in spite of having a pretty good idea of where the story was headed due to reading the books, I mean, I've got my well thumbed copy of Nemesis Games right here. Nonetheless, the feelings of suspense were absolutely incredible, and from now on, anytime someone asks me why I'm such a fan of the show, the short answer will simply be the season 5 finale, which for my money brilliantly delivered one great payoff after another to so many ongoing storylines, while at the same time, opening the door to staggering changes to the existing status quo as we head into season 6. To be honest, every season of The Expanse has brought about seismic changes to this fictional setting. We expect that. But even so, I imagine that the last few minutes of this episode made a lot of viewers' jaws just drop straight down to the floor. And not surprisingly, the episode was written by the authors of the series, Ty Frank, Daniel Abraham, as well as series showrunner Naren Shankar. So if you've not seen the episode, fair warning, this is going to be a pretty spoiler-heavy breakdown that's geared towards people who've been following and enjoying the show. If you're new to The Expanse, I'll simply say that between the books and the show, The Expanse is a guaranteed Hall of Famer in the genre of science fiction. I vigorously recommend that folks take a crack at both. But with that spoiler warning out of the way, let's get down to it. My suspicion is that many diehard fans are going to be eagerly discussing and picking over all the details of this episode basically for a year. There was so much stuff for us to sink our teeth into and so many new threats to consider. The battles in space were just awe-inspiring, in my opinion, the best of all five seasons. But we also saw an incredibly satisfying double cross. We had reunions. We saw the death of a central character. The full scope and magnitude of a grand conspiracy was finally unveiled. But most important of all for me, the ending gave us the biggest plot development involving the protomolecule since the ring gate first opened. I always enjoy the strange mix of horror and fascination I experience when I see the many ways the protomolecule can be put to use. And to put it mildly, the new Martian colony on Laconia is a true game changer for this story. Also, if you didn't stick around for the full credits, there is one final tease of the ship in Laconia's atmosphere that everyone should take a look at. And as if all this was not enough, I haven't even mentioned yet the mysterious eradication of the Barkeith as it tried to pass through the Laconia Gate, a scene where readers of the books will have to do some tap dancing over the next year to avoid spoilers, but I'll be getting to that scene toward the end of my video. But it was an incredible cliffhanger that comes straight from the epilogue to Nemesis Games, and it serves as a brutal reminder that the universe of the Expanse is never short of terrifying threats that human beings can barely understand. Honestly, there's so much cool stuff to discuss in this episode, I need you to slow down and discuss this episode piece by bloody piece. I think one of the most satisfying aspects of this episode was the way that all the various subplots finally collided into one greater whole. There's been a method to the story's madness all along this season, and I imagine that no matter what viewers thought along the way, I suspect that most will now agree that the trip was very much worth the journey. What was great was how the episode was front-loaded with so much action, we got to eat our dessert first. The free Navy ships that were hunting down the Rosinante, they all looked so gnarly, and it was so cool how the show would slow down to establish the individual enemies. And from the conversations between Holden, Bull, and Monica, it was abundantly clear that this was not a battle that the Rosinante could win. Already low on fuel and ammo after their battle with the Zemea, the best the Rosinante can hope for is to buy some time for Alex so that he and Bobby can save Naomi. What gave me chills was the way that Holden got Bull really psyched up for what could potentially be a glorious death. And I was just getting what I can only describe as like waves of euphoria as Holden was describing how Marco killed millions and he murdered Freds and he started a war. You can just feel his rage as he says, they wanted a fight, we'll give them one. And Bull gets so fired up, he compares what they're about to attempt with emptying their fucking magazines right in their enemies' faces. The only real tension or disagreement between Holden and Bull is over Bull's use of the word skinnies to describe belters. Admittedly, Bull's getting fired up to fight to the death, but in his lust for battle, he kind of forgets that Holden is in love with somebody from the belt. What was crazy about this part of the episode, though, was how, for a few straight minutes, the hairs were standing straight up on my forearms. I was just completely pumped. And all these little lines of dialogue and little details just kept enhancing my sense of excitement. Like when Alex tells Holden to give him hell, which is exactly what Holden plans to do. What he doesn't know is that Drummer has had enough of all Marco's bullshit and she's planning a full-blown double cross. And one of my favorite fist pump moments of the episode, Drummer pulls Carol's gun and takes her ship back over and then launches what looks like 
every bit of offensive power her ship can muster at the free navy ships they're supposed to be working with. And the Rossi's odds go from hopeless to relatively even in a matter of moments as one of the coolest space battles in the history of television erupted in epic fashion. And a battle breaks out on Drummer's ship as well. Carol gets killed. But then as the dust settles and Drummer and Holden join forces for a brief shining moment, it felt like there might be a brief happy ending for our characters after all. Meanwhile, in the Chetsumoka, we saw Naomi putting her ship into a spiral in order to prevent Alex from trying to dock with the ship and setting off the trap. But of course, Alex, who's an ace pilot, he's determined to try nonetheless. So in desperation, Naomi launches herself right out into space and starts using Belter hand signals to warn him of the danger. And it's thanks to Bobby who first notices that something has fallen off the Chetsumoka. And then we get this really cool scene that unfolds exclusively from Naomi's point of view with the camera locked within her helmet. So we experience her relief firsthand as Bobby brings her air and saves her. But the relief we feel is mixed with sadness as the character Alex dies from a stroke due to the earlier hard burn. Now, this is obviously a massive departure from the books due to Cass Anvar being let go from the show over sexual harassment allegations. I don't have all the details of what he did, but we know for a fact he will not be returning in season six. But the removal of the character of Alex will obviously have a major impact on how season six is able to adapt Babylon's ashes. But as the old expression goes, the show must go on. In the aftermath of the battle, Marco is enraged and responds in typical fashion by executing a member of Drummer's crew by pushing him out an airlock and then sending Drummer and her crew the the footage, but Drummer, she knew this was going to be the cost of her decision, and she made it anyway. And it's this kind of decision that all Belters are going to have to wrestle with moving forward, to join with Marco or not. But now Drummer officially has her own little splinter faction within the Belter community. And now for anyone out there who had not yet read the book Nemesis Games, I imagine at this point, they thought that the remaining time in this episode would be used for reunions and heartfelt moments between Naomi and Holden, and for many opportunities where the characters could in their own way say farewell to the character of Alex. But now the episode's over, obviously, there was a lot more story to tell, but it was a beautiful piece of storytelling, the way that the episode lulled us into this false sense of security. First, all the characters, they enjoy this incredible reunion on Luna, where Ava Sarala is now in full control. Naomi's going to get full immunity in exchange for everything she knows about Marco and Naros. And we get some fun comedy as Amos accidentally breaks his bottle of tequila while saying goodbye to Eric. And as we see, Eric has a new ambition of carving out a new empire on a new colony planet. But one of the more interesting scenes is when Amos asks to speak to Holden in private. And it reminds him of this time early in their history where Holden was on the verge of shooting him. And not really knowing where this conversation's headed, Holden's all about putting the past behind them and reminding him that they're all family now. And Amos is delighted he feels that way because Holden has now fallen into Amos's trap. Because Amos has decided to bring Clarissa Mao on board to be a permanent addition to their crew once they found a way to assign her with a new fake identity. And Holden's reaction was just priceless. You could have basically knocked him over with a feather because Holden hasn't been there for this giant redemptive arc for Clarissa's character. And for me, her relationship with Amos is by far one of the coolest ongoing storylines in the whole series. And for people who want the deep dive into her character arc, I strongly recommend people check out Wes Chatham's interview with actress Nadine Nicole and the after show for The Expanse about episode nine. But what's fascinating now is like five seasons deep, the way we've seen the rise and fall and potential rise again of the Mao family. Because we've seen Clarissa's father and his mad ambitions for the protomolecule. And we've seen our sister essentially becoming a living asteroid that hurdles right into Venus in order to gather the materials to build the ring. Overall, the Mal family has been through a hell of a lot. But for us as fans, having a cybernetically enhanced killing machine aboard the Rossi in season six that's something that's obviously going to come in handy. In any case, the overwhelming happy feelings of this episode abruptly come to an end during what looks like a really fun cocktail party. Ava Sarala is enjoying this moment of unity, calling attention to how much Marco would hate the sight of people from Earth, Mars, and the Belt all getting along, enjoying their drinks. This is what victory looks like. But the first warning sign that something might be wrong is when Monica brings up the fact that one of the Zamaya's torpedoes that they lost track of could have been carrying the proto-molecule. High five to Pete Peppers for pointing out on his channel a few weeks back that this was most likely the case. And then disaster strikes. As we see, Marco's not dismayed by the survival of the Rosinante. He has far bigger fish to fry as he tells Philip, you must always have a knife in the darkness. While it takes three hours for Ava Sarala to get any real-time data about what's happening, we see that with the help of a stealth-coded micro-meteor cloud, Marco and his free navy lead this crushing attack on the ships outside the ring gate. And much to the horror of Ava Sarala and her allies, we see that they have surprise help from their fellow belters from within Medina Station firing missiles 
out of the ships that are defending the entrance. And you can't even really call it a battle. It was just destruction. But it was incredible to behold, even if this assault means catastrophe for the entire solar system with the free navy now controlling all traffic to and from the colony planets. But then things get really interesting. I almost started choking with excitement as I saw how Avasarala and her allies mistakenly breathe a sigh of relief and get all excited when they see the arrival of MCRN ships, including the Barkeith. And as those ships pull up to the ring gate, I imagine a lot of viewers unfamiliar with the book felt the same way. But then we hear this rather ominous bit of information that these ships were previously reported destroyed by the Free Navy. Because as it turns out, an entire fleet of Martian ships have gone rogue. And as they join Marco in his assault on those ships defending the ring gate, finally the full magnitude of this conspiracy becomes clear. And I've been dying to talk about this conspiracy all season. We've seen so many clues every step of the way, but now we've got the big picture. We know that a splinter faction of Martians, led by Admiral Duarte, they've completely bailed on their home planet, and they've come to this arrangement with Marco, where they supplied Marco with ships and weapons in exchange for the protomolecule, as well as exclusive rights to everything beyond the gate, headed toward Laconia. And with the ring gate now fully under Marco's control, no one can pursue Duarte and his rogue Martians unless they get through Marco first. The giant attack on Earth killing millions, it was all just a giant destruction distraction while their true plan was hatched. And as far as Ava Sarala is concerned, she's totally bewildered as to why anyone would want to take the protomolecule through the ring gate after everybody saw what happened on Illus during season four. Holden suspects that this rogue faction knows something that they don't know, and he's absolutely right. Admiral Duarte has been plotting and scheming for this day for a long time, and the final scene of the episode tells us so much with a scene aboard the Barkeith with Captain Savater, if I'm saying that correctly, first talking to Marco, who seems very happy with the deal that he struck. Marco gets control of the ring gate, and he doesn't bat an eyelid when he hears that the Martians have already covered their side of the Laconia gate with all sorts of mines. Clearly, Duarte doesn't want anybody going through that gate unless they're part of his cause and his faction, and I suspect that if Marco weren't so happy with his victory, he might be suspicious about what prize the Martians were truly after? Well, we as the audience get to learn this info immediately when a message comes through from Cortazar to Savater. And while Dr. Cortazar might have had his mind surgically altered in order to feel less emotion, even so, he is beside himself with excitement over what's happening on Laconia. He confirms that they received the protomolecule, which is in turn waking up and activating all the alien structures beneath Laconia's surface, as well as in the planet's atmosphere, which includes the most sinister looking ship that we've ever seen. And this is the kind of breathtaking horror that makes me such a fan of The Expanse and what sets it apart from so many other sci-fi franchises. And even though this episode had already given us so much red meat with so many incredible plot twists and turns, the episode had one final surprise in store for us. As Savater is dressing down an officer for her lack of ideological purity for wearing a personal item that's not a part of her official regulation uniform, the Barkeith starts flying through the gate into Laconian space. But then everything freezes right before all hell breaks loose as some malignant force completely reduces the ship to atoms, or even less, the Barkeith and its crew simply cease to exist. Now, I'm not going to give away anything from the subsequent books, but if you want a clue about what happened in the context of this season, I want to remind everybody about a scene early in the season between Fred and Holden, where Holden called attention to an even bigger potential threat than the builders of the protomolecule. But if you want a full itemized breakdown of what happens on the Barkeith in really specific detail, the last few paragraphs of the epilogue to Nemesis games, the tease all sorts of horrifying images. But I can't really say anything more on that front without divulging info from the next book and obviously next season. What's crazy is how the heroes of the Expanse are now confronted with more dangers and more enemies to overcome than at any other point in the story. Between Marco controlling Medina Station, Duarte and Cortazar committing unholy atrocities on Laconia, and whatever it was that destroyed the Barkeith, clearly Holden and his friends are going to have their hands full in season six. And as I mentioned before, during the credits, we got one final look at that monstrous looking Laconian ship. And I love how the clouds slowly parted, giving us a better look, including this kind of ominous purple glow as the ship starts coming to life. As a fan of really dark science fiction, my only response is, I am completely in heaven. So as you've probably gathered so far, I enjoyed this episode. I fucking loved it. And the fact that I have book nine to look forward to later this year, as well as season six whenever it's finished, knowing that fills me with nothing but complete and total geeky joy. And my hope is that season six will be so damn cool there'll be no choice but to continue with the show down the road. Or perhaps Amazon might get behind producing a trilogy of movies to adapt books seven through nine. But for now, let's just savor the moment of having experienced a fantastic season of television. 
But I think I've talked y'all's ears off enough at this point. For all of you who've been sticking with me all season long, you have my sincere gratitude. I'll definitely be doing similar breakdowns of all future Marvel shows, as well as any cool sci-fi, fantasy, or horror shows that grab my attention. But if you've enjoyed my rants, please consider subscribing to the channel, liking the video, all that good stuff, hitting the notification bell. And if you want to talk more about sci-fi or whatever, hunt me down on Twitter at Colbrax. But thanks so much for watching the video. I greatly appreciate it. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.